Nowadays, it's not too uncommon for games to be accused of stealing things from other video games. It seems like there's always a gray area between the lines of inspiration and plagiarism, but what happens in the court of public opinion? Or what happens when a game studio actually gets taken to court? There's a lot of interesting examples of these types of things happening over the course of video game history, and seriously, some of these instances are absolutely insane. Like, let's start with Pal World for a second. This game has been massively popular, one of the biggest games to release in a while. It is often toted as, it's like Pokemon, but with guns. Seriously, that's a pretty awesome way to explain what this game is. But record scratch, Luke, make the screen black and white for a second. In the time since we've recorded this, Nintendo's actually come out of the woodwork and made an official statement regarding Pal World and the similarities that some fans are saying look too much like Pokemon. Sure, their statement is pretty vague. They just acknowledge that another company released a game in January 2024, and they've received many inquiries regarding that game. They state that they have not granted any permission for the use of Pokemon's intellectual property or assets in game, and they further went on to say that they intend to investigate and take appropriate measures to address any acts that infringe on intellectual property rights related to the Pokemon. And then they ended it with, we will continue to cherish and nurture each and every Pokemon in its world and work to bring the world together through Pokemon in the future. I don't know what that last part is, it just reminds me that my boy Venonat is definitely underutilized in the Pokemon series. I mean, ultimately, this statement's kind of just an empty comment so far but it will lead to an interesting discourse down the road if Nintendo does choose to take action. This stuff gets really, really crazy, and we'll talk about that stuff in just a second, but first, let's pay some bills. War Thunder is the ultimate vehicle combat game out there, and you can grab it for free on your PC or console right now. It's a huge playground with over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships from 10 different nations. You can go all the way back to the biplanes and armored cars of the 1920s, or jump into the latest fighter jets and main battle tanks. This game is seriously immersive, with incredibly detailed vehicles, realistic graphics, graphics, and authentic sound effects that make you feel like you're in the driver's seat of some of the most powerful war machines around today. You won't be alone either, as there's a massive global community of over 70 million players waiting for you in epic PvP battles, so if you're a history buff or just love military action, this might be the game for you. Also, there's no need for fancy hardware. You can hop into the tank or take to the skies in any aircraft using just your trusty mouse and keyboard or controller, and when it comes to making your vehicles stand out, War Thunder has you covered. Its customization is really impressive. There's a lot of different camouflages, historical markings, and decorations available for all sorts of vehicles, including ones created by the community. So play War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox using our link for exclusive bonuses. New and returning players who haven't played in six months or longer will receive a massive bonus pack, including premium vehicles, the Eagle of Valor Decorator, 100,000 Silver Lions, and seven days of a premium account. Plus, until the end of January, all players get three exclusive Gaijin Snail decals to deck out their vehicles, so hurry up. These offers are only available for a limited time. Okay, so why are people so mad at Pal World? After the launch of Pal World, the more the game was purchased and was being played in more of a mainstream light, the more disdain and conversation about why the game couldn't be good started to arise in different parts of the internet, especially like Twitter. This led to some pretty big accusations from certain video game players in the community that would end up spreading like wildfire online. Accusations accusing Pal World of plagiarism from Pokemon and from doing things like AI generation to copy some features to create their own individual Pokemon or Pals in Pal World. It's some pretty damning stuff. However, I've spent a lot of time looking into all of this and following this controversy as it grew. I've looked at other examples. I've looked at references. I've looked at the things that people claim are obvious. And despite the similarities in art styles between Pal World and Pokemon, I still lean towards saying that no, Pal World did not explicitly steal anything from Pokemon in a legal sense. Now, of course, if things ever change, like there was a lawsuit or some new evidence came to light after this video goes out, I'll put my foot in my mouth and be like, yeah, I, this is this is bad. But I think during the development of Pal World, the team spent a lot of time emulating the art style of Pokemon, studying the art style of Pokemon, and what makes Pokemon themselves so appealing to the masses, and then from there took that as inspiration for designing their own creatures. These are often some of the bigger examples that are used saying that, look, it's obvious, they just copied Pokemon, but are these really direct copies if you look at it? I mean, this is a sheep in Pokemon, Wooloo, and this is the one 
one that they say Power World stole. I mean, yeah, they both have wool, but the one in Power World is like round and walks on two legs. Wooloo walks on four legs, it has dreadlocks, they have different faces, different color horns. You can't really make the argument that the color aesthetic is stolen when sheep just look like that. And it's examples like this that keep getting like brought up on Twitter and stuff where people show them side by side and look, it's obvious. Like I said, I think during the design process, they went through a phase of studying the Pokemon and likely referenced design features like faces, eyes, mouths, bodies, and different variations. And then when they moved into the actual like 3D modeling phase, they already had these features studied and prepared to best take on the established Pokemon art style, but put it in their own way. Now, some people actually pulled the models from the latest Pokemon games, saying that the proportions of Pokemon to pals are way too similar. I can see the argument, but is it plagiarism if you pull something up as a reference image or something when you're working on a completely original design? I mean, yeah, sure, in a couple of the models, the proportions are similar, but they're always still different. And design process aside, at the end of the day, the final version of the game that launched that people paid money for, the characters are different. They are not Pokemon. There's no denying that this isn't a Pokemon. I think it's an interesting analysis, but once again, unless something new comes out or Nintendo has a reason to pursue this as a trademark or copyright infringement, I think this game doesn't cross the line as a plagiarized thing. And mind you, Nintendo hasn't taken action yet, and they usually move really quickly when it comes to things that infringe on their copyright, like a lot of the fan games that release over the years that Nintendo quickly shuts down. Matter of fact, there was a fan-made mod to replace the PALs with Pokemon in PAL World, and while the creator's been pretty ambiguous, apparently Nintendo's coming after him. This seems like a very ominous announcement. Interesting that Nintendo jumps on the mod right away, but hasn't done anything to Pal World. Also, what does it mean when it says Nintendo is coming after him? That's scary. They sent the Nintendo ninjas after him. Of course, the AI accusations against Pal World are even less substantial. Matter of fact, there isn't any proof to any real degree that AI was used to make any of the character models or any part of the game. I think if anything, this is something that someone brought up in the conversation of of talking about why Power World might not be a good game, what I think is just to be a contrarian to all of the Power World success. The main origin of the AI accusations come from an old tweet from the Power World developer CEO stating that he was impressed that BuzzFeed could utilize Dale AI to make Pokemon lookalikes that were almost indistinguishable from real Pokemon. Somehow, people took this and ran with it as proof that the company used AI, which I think is really weird, especially since most of the big AI tools that were used and then were controversial for potentially stealing artists' pieces as reference points didn't really happen until mid-2022, but the first Power World trailer, which shows a ton of the designs and characters, first dropped a year earlier in 2021. The only other thing that people can draw from is the fact that the development team did make this other game last year based on identifying AI art in this like party game, but as far as I'm aware, with the current info that's out there, it's unrelated to Power World, and though if some people want to boycott anything that this developer puts out because they did something with AI art at some point in the past, I mean, that's their own prerogative. And that's probably the only fair argument I can see for someone not wanting to play Pal World for all of the controversies. So I can respect that one because at least that argument is based in some truth, but the other arguments, uh, it's a lot harder to get behind. Also, at the end of the day, Pal World is a completely different experience than any Pokemon game I've ever played. I think this plays more like Ark or Valheim first before it would play like any Pokemon game that exists, but I digress. Nintendo hasn't seemed to bad and I at other Pokemon inspired games either. I mean, games like Nexomon, Temtem, and other games are on the Switch and have character models that also have similarities to real Pokemon. Like I said, I'd be open to hearing a different argument if one comes up, like Nintendo does file a lawsuit or something like that. That would be interesting. But Pokemon itself references pop culture, Japanese folklore, and other things themselves as well. So I don't really know if that could hold up, but it does remind me of something else though. But get this, back Back in the Xbox 360 days, right around the rise in popularity of Minecraft, Minecraft wasn't available on consoles just yet. But Minecraft on PC was already a huge phenomenon. So what are the Xbox players supposed to do? There's no Minecraft. But on the Xbox Indie Store, there's a cheap... Minecraft looking knockoff called Castle Miner Z, which essentially was knockoff Minecraft, but with guns. This was a wild game, but it was incredibly fun to dive into. It took all of the concepts from Minecraft, like mining, crafting, building, and you know, just progressing all of your tools as you go, but added in some really hard enemies and guns, and boom, this is what we played a ton back in the day. Now, of course, there were a lot of Minecraft fans out there 
arguing that this game was just a cheap knockoff of Minecraft, but back in the day, Minecraft was exclusive to PC, and this is all some of us had to play. But the unique premise of adding weapons and having more of this like progression where you're trying to get as far out as possible, almost like a score system just based on your distance from where you started, still made this game stand out and have its own identity separate from what Minecraft was. Unlike some of the ones we're going to talk about in this video, there wasn't a lawsuit or massive claims of plagiarism thrown at Castle Miner Z for being Minecraft but with guns, but it took the idea of Minecraft and kind of did something different and I think that was really cool. And then you know what? When Minecraft came to Xbox, I bought it, as did most of my friends who really enjoyed Castle Miner Z as well. I just think it's interesting, there's a lot of parallels here to what we just talked about with Pal World, but of course this happened in a time before Twitter discourse was, well you know what Twitter discourse is nowadays. Nonetheless, you could still play this game on Xbox 360 and it released on Steam surprisingly later on which is really cool and this is of course just one example there were so many other minecraft like clones and quote-unquote ripoffs that happened after the huge success that minecraft was and these examples are really just one of these conversation pieces where we have to kind of figure out how to decide what counts as inspiration and what counts as like stealing an idea when it comes to like video game intellectual property and creative attribution do you think castle miner z just blatantly ripped off minecraft what about infinite miner this was a project created by Zach Barth all the way back in 2009, and Marcus Person, who's Notch known for creating Minecraft, has mentioned it multiple times as the main inspiration for what started Minecraft. And while Barth has been credited multiple times for his role in essentially being one of the four founders of the Minecraft voxel genre, it's not like he had any equity or payouts from Minecraft and he never took it to court or anything, so maybe he didn't have a legal case, or maybe he just didn't want to go to court. The source code of InfiniMiner is covered under like a public use MIT license. However, with all this in mind, will we see kind of a repeat of history when inevitably Hytale eventually releases? I mean, this game is directly being developed by the team of modders who made Hypixel the popular Minecraft server and they spun off to make their own game essentially. I mean obviously the game's not going to be a carbon copy but neither was Pal World but people went harsh on it so I don't know this will be interesting to see what happens you know that is of course if Hytale ever does actually eventually come out. It's been delayed quite a few times since it was originally revealed all the way back in like 2018. It's actually insane. But this stuff lands more into like the courts of the public opinion. What about times where things actually started legal proceedings or had some lawsuits with some settlements, some of that juicy financial stuff? We actually saw something like this in the mid 2000s where Sega went after Simpsons Road Rage for like the crazy taxi games and mechanics and was willing to go to court to fight it out with a lawsuit. Lawsuit. Now, Luke knows more about the Simpsons games than I do, so I'm gonna let Luke explain what happened here, because it is really interesting. In the early 2000s, The Simpsons actually had a few games that kind of, like, ripped off some other games. Most famously, there's Hidden Run, which obviously is a GTA clone. Then there was The Simpsons Skateboarding, which is a Tony Hawk clone. And that's also where Road Rage comes in, which is a Crazy Taxi clone. Now, the term clone is just to describe them. It's not to discredit these games, because The Simpsons Hidden Run was a pretty good game, for example. But after Simpsons Road Rage released, Sega felt like they got their copyright infringed on, so they filed a lawsuit. Now this lawsuit was actually filed against the developer Radical Entertainment, Electronic Arts which were the publisher, and Fox as well since they own the rights to The Simpsons. Now I don't know all the legal terms, but I think the developer at the time filed like a counterclaim, you know, saying that they didn't infringe on anything or that there was no patent, so they couldn't have infringed on anything. No, actually this lawsuit never went to court because the case was settled at a private mediation. Right to any court hearings or any court proceedings happening. It is sad though that they settled for an undisclosed money amount, so I think Sega got some money, which I guess was good enough for them and I think the game remained published. Okay, next I wanted to talk about Genshin Impact. While this game first released in Asian markets, there was a ton of controversy leading up into the release of the game and it's actually really interesting to look at. So at an event called China Joy back in 2019, Genshin Impact, a game that would release on PlayStation 4 and 
mobile devices was revealed and a lot of people were like wow this this looks a lot like the legend of zelda breath of the wild now to be fair the game is very heavily inspired by zelda breath of the wild they've talked about that being one of their big inspirations but also this game was modeled as a gotcha live service game that would have an evolving world over time and new elements a ton of different playable characters and had plans for co-op player houses and a whole lot of other things like i said this game was built as a live service model so the game would be free to play for everyone and then of course the really hardcore whales would spend a lot of money on like microtransactions and whatnot but i think with the initial reveal people didn't understand that this game was going down that route they just saw what looked to them as a legend of zelda breath of the wild clone and the outrage was insane there were like pictures that surfaced online of people smashing their own playstation 4 at the event out of anger of the announcement of genshin impact which hold up how does smashing your own playstation prove anything you're just destroying your own property to try to make a point that doesn't make any sense there were pictures of people holding up their switches and zelda breath of the wild out of protest at the genshin impact booth the anger was enormous but when the game came out and people actually got to play the game a lot of people really enjoyed it they were able to recognize that there was a big inspiration by zelda breath of the wild but once you get past like the visuals at the beginning the game is dramatically different i mean say what you will about live service games but it's still really impressive what genshin was able to pull off and they do have a pretty dedicated fan base surrounding this game nowadays actually it's really interesting that the team was originally really small working on genshin impact and rather inexperienced and it's kind of interesting to listen to the president of mihoyo liu wei kind of talk about overcoming the unexpected backlash when they revealed the game apparently the backlash took a really big mental and emotional toll on a lot of the team and eventually they kind of just pulled themselves out of it and decided that they were going to try to prove to everyone who didn't believe in them that they could make like a triple a mobile game project that was inspired but also original as well i'll be honest i was really surprised when splitgate finally came to console and it had its like big little blow up for a couple of months that there were some people who genuinely thought that splitgate was like just a stolen carbon copy of halo which is kind of wild i mean sure they're both similar arena shooters and splitgate is very much inspired by the gameplay of halo but that'd be like saying halo back in the day was just a carbon copy of quake still i find amusement out of reading some old reddit posts of people wondering why 343 industries hadn't sued the splitgate developers i'm not just like making this conversation up this is a real thing that people talked about i mean yes there are weapons that are very obviously inspired and taken from halo like the railgun the battle rifle i mean you could say that since it's the red team versus the blue team and there's games like oddball king of the hill and swat these things come straight from halo and maybe they do but once again we fall into this thing where it's like how do you copyright gameplay would like the first team deathmatch game out there like have a legal claim to that game type altogether even more so it seems like a lot of the conversations kind of forget the fact that splitgate did have the whole portal implementation which made it stand out from halo i mean i think a lot of people wanted splitgate to just not even have the portals to some extent so it could play more like old halo did because the newer halo games don't play like this my favorite argument by far though Though, is the fact that the company that made Splitgate, which is 1047 Games, is stolen from Halo because if you take the company name 343, multiply it by 3, and then add 18, it's 1047. <laughs> I don't understand the connection. I think the name actually came from like the room number where they worked on the game in like the office or something or apartment building where they worked on the game. But honestly, I can see how Bungie isn't going to sue this game and hopefully it stays that way. What? <laughs> I don't know. The way I see it is if unless a game is like straight up ripping assets one for one and just like not even changing it or they're trying to use like the name of another game or the character from another game, I'm all for games replicating gameplay style and things like that and just let the best game win that's how it maybe should be within reason of course nobody go and be like oh my gosh does that mean you mean this because i probably don't if it's some crazy take that you come up with now remember the day before and that whole controversy and if you don't know what the day before was let's call it a very ambitious mmo project that turned into an extraction shooter that basically released and then shut down within a week and it's basically seen as a big scam now and also before the game released there was a lot of controversy because they straight up ripped off 
of other games marketing material in their own trailers and posted screenshots. Now this ranged from Call of Duty to Resident Evil to like The Division and Rockstar games. It was just really random and really bizarre and even the voice in the trailer would say similar things to what other games had said in their trailers. The weapons, which can be modified, are made with maximum realism to ensure that combat remains deep and engaging at all times. Make combat deep and engaging at all times. Each weapon boasts unique characteristics, as well as realistic reload and recoil mechanics. Each weapon has unique characteristics with realistic reload and recoil. Obviously nothing ever came of it because it was just marketing material, but I remember that was like the first big the day before controversy. No matter what state the game was in, there was always some controversy surrounding it. One game that actually might have almost gone to court, but then didn't quite go to court, was back in 2017 after the release of Fortnite, when Player Unknown Battlegrounds decided to target Epic Games for copying their game concept. A little history section, back in 2017, PUBG gained massive popularity as being this new mainstream battle royale game and as many of you know Fortnite was just like this survival save the world type game that later was pivoted into a battle royale mode that gained huge success shortly after PUBG's massive rise to fame. Now PUBG Corporation which formerly was just Blue Hole apparently expressed concerns that Fortnite's battle royale mode was way too similar to PUBG and they argued that Fortnite's gameplay and user interface too closely resembled PUBG's and they were working worried about potential copyright infringement. So PUBG Corporation in 2018 filed a lawsuit against Epic Games in the South Korean courts, alleging copyright infringement and claiming that Fortnite copied elements of PUBG's gameplay. This news was really big across the Battle Royale community because first of all, people were curious on how this would go because while Player Unknown himself was involved in most of the big Battle Royale games up until that point, Fortnite did just kind of come out of nowhere and just all of a sudden introduce their own Battle Royale mode. But was this that different really from from just having another game existing in the same genre. I mean, there were first person shooters that existed before Call of Duty existed, but Call of Duty never got sued for stealing an idea. This became a huge talking point about what counts as like a genre and what counts as like a proprietary game experience. And this legal battle between PUBG Corp and Epic Games was actually really short lived. A month later, PUBG Corp announced that they were dropping their lawsuit against Epic Games. And while the reasons behind dropping the lawsuit were never officially disclosed, one of two things could have happened. Either the two companies reached some sort of settlement, which resulted in PUBG Corp just like not pursuing the lawsuit anymore, or there's speculation that Epic Games maybe threatened to like revoke a license or something from PUBG Corp. I mean, PUBG itself is built in the Unreal Engine, which Epic Games owns. And matter of fact, Epic Games helped Blue Hole working on parts of the engine that would allow for a hundred players to connect simultaneously. Now, now that stuff is speculative, but all we do know is a month later, PUBG was like, okay, actually we changed our mind. We're not doing this legal thing. Nonetheless, nowadays, PUBG and Fortnite still coexist, and there's other battle royale games that use the same format that PUBG, I guess, popularized here. Nonetheless, it was a wild time. Also, back in 2009, there was an interesting story where Tetris straight up took another game studio to court. Another studio known as Zeo Interactive released a mobile game called Minnow, which was based on the gameplay of Tetris, and a Apparently for a while they tried to get like a license to use Tetris branding, but then they couldn't get it. So they're just like, eh, release the game anyways. Sega didn't like that. They ended up taking the Minnow team to court and after some debate, it turned out that Sega would end up winning the lawsuit. The case wasn't appealed at all by the Minnow team. Finally though, at the end of the day, it seems like these two studios ended up reconciling or at least not doing much more to each other. And nonetheless, Tetris was able to make out with making a little bit of a decent profit. Another game that had some controversy kind of around the same time of the day before was Dark and Darker. Dark and Darker is like this medieval dungeon crawler game that's also an extraction shooter. It's kind of an interesting mix. Now in 2023 there were some heavy allegations made against Iron Maze, the developer of Dark and Darker, by the Korean publisher Nexon. Now if I understand this correctly, they alleged that Dark and Darker was very similar to a game that they had been internally developing and then one of the key people of that team actually leaked information about that project and later even started working for Iron Maze after he was fired from Nexon. Now this is obviously 
basically all alleged, and Iron Maze denied all the allegations, and they stated that the game genre could not be copyrighted, and that the game was created from ground up using Unreal Engine assets and handmade code. Now from there the story actually just picks up. In March of 2023 there was a police raid at the studio trying to find evidence of these allegations, and Nexon actually also went on to file a DMCA notice with Steam, making it so Dark and Darker got removed from the Steam store. What happened to the project though is it continued on. Just a month later they had their fifth playtest, they kept developing the game and found a way to distribute these playtests without the use of Steam. Now Nexon wasn't taking this lightly and they filed another copyright infringement lawsuit this time in the United States of America. And actually after a few months that lawsuit was dismissed by the United States court and Dark and Darker has been trying to get back on the Steam store saying that the copyright infringement claims by Nexon were meritless. Now this all happened very recently within the last couple months and as of recording this there is no updates on any lawsuits or settlements that I could find but the last information we do know is that about like two or three weeks ago the Korean ESRB equivalent rated Dark and Darker meaning that the game can officially get a commercial release in Korea and I mean that's kind of where the case is at right now so we'll see if the game actually returns to Steam and obviously we don't know for sure but it doesn't look like there was any massive evidence uncovered or any real wrongdoing proven on the part of Iron Maze. This next one doesn't fully count as like stolen. Well, actually, I don't know. Maybe it does. Harvest Moon. A lot of you guys probably played this back in the day. It was a cool like farming game and like life simulator game. But little did you know, the game series was originally made in Japan and then localized into the West under the name Harvest Moon. But in an early and original deal made for those older games, the localization team gained the rights to the name Harvest Moon while the developer and publisher owned the rights to the game content. But eventually in 2012, Marvelous, the publisher of the games, decided not to license the series to Natsume Inc. anymore, which meant since they they didn't own the rights to the Harvest Moon name, all of the future games would have to be renamed as Story of Seasons. So then at that same time, Natsume Inc, not married to a publisher, but still having the rights to Harvest Moon said, hey, we'll just make our own Harvest Moon game without the original developer or publisher and release it under the Harvest Moon title because we own it. And thus they did. They released a game called Harvest Moon The Lost Valley, which was a 3DS game and it wasn't very good. It got uh, some like four out of 10 and three out of tens. A few years later, they would release another game, Harvest Moon Light of Hope, and it also wasn't all that good. Uh, I mean, it was a little better than the last one, but I mean, is that really saying all that much? Uh, I don't know. Meanwhile, the original developer and publisher continued to make more games in the Story of Seasons franchise, which is just Harvest Moon renamed. They did some remakes, they did some new stuff, and generally scored a bit better than the Harvest Moon games, you know, getting closer to like that six to seven out of ten range, even a couple of eight out of tens. I I do think it's really shady though that a company that originally had nothing to do with development just decided to start making Harvest Moon games to try to confuse consumers thinking that it's like the same game series and games that they had originally played back in the day just like the next entry but really it's just a really like uninspired knockoff of what they expected uh, just it's a weird it's a weird feeling I don't know just the way that Harvest Moon has been handled just feels really shady I'm not sure that I like it. As you can see in this video, sometimes fans get really protective of their genre, but one genre that actually gets a lot of games is the Souls-like genre, which is obviously pioneered by Dark Souls and Elden Ring. One such game that came out last year was Plague Faith Forsaken. And when the game came out, people started kind of calling out the game for having the same animations as Elden Ring and other From Software titles. So there was a bunch of accusations made online. Now what's interesting, none of these accusations were about how Plague Faith Forsaken is also a Souls-like game and you know that's kind of ripping off Dark Souls. Like we've seen a few times in this video where people get really protective of a genre and I don't think you can copyright a genre. But since all these allegations actually focused on something like animations, the developer was able to respond and they actually said that they purchased an animation pack for the Unreal Engine and this animation pack included animations that were just like the animations from Elden Ring, but they didn't know that at the time when they bought it. They explained that about 10% of the assets were purchased from the Epic Marketplace. Now I 
think the Epic Marketplace works in a way much like eBay or Amazon where, you know, you can have your storefront and different people can sell different items. So it is actually very likely and very plausible that they didn't know about these animations being from Elden Ring and Dark Souls games. And at the time of the statement, they actually already had patched out some of these animations and they said that they will patch out the rest of the animations as well, which I think is a good response to the whole thing. And this is actually kind of a unique situation because the animations were clearly from Elden Ring and Dark Souls, but I don't think there was any fault from the developer. And now that these animations are gone, you know, people actually seem to like Bleak Faith Forsaken and it's apparently a pretty good game. So the story kind of has a positive outcome. Do you guys remember Fallout 4's DLC Far Harbor? Often cited to be one of the best DLCs in the entire Fallout series. Well, apparently there's a quest line that has kind of drummed up some speculation from the community as to whether or not this quest line, Brain Dead, was actually taken from a fan-made mod project that released for Fallout New Vegas just before the release of Fallout 4. The original quest, called Autumn Leaves, posted by Baron Von Chateau, was a pretty big project for Fallout New Vegas. It had like 2,000 pro-voiced lines and was kind of like this whodunit murder mystery story. And shortly after the release of the Far Harbor DLC, a discussion was posted where people started drawing comparisons to Autumn Leaves on the ModDB form. Here's a quick run through of some of the similarities. Both quests start with a discussion through an inner phone with some sort of caretaker of the vault with like a big vault door opening. Both games have you then go into the like this big lobby type room with carpet. Both quests have you then go investigate a murder by checking the crime scene and speaking to the robots in the vault and they each have their own identity based on different pitches of each robot. They both oddly have like this one very similar like innuendo at one point. There's a discussion about paintings and from there the list kind of goes on. Now as far as what the original creator of the mod had to say it seems like he kind of posted about it on the mod db page just to raise more awareness of his mod because he wanted more people to check it out and play the fallout new vegas mod and that was kind of the gists of it there was never any official statement from bethesda or anything like that though it is likely that bethesda maybe played the mod and was inspired and decided to do their own smaller story quest inspired by that but yeah ultimately they're different enough and i mean Technically, they're both Fallout games. Even one's just a community-made fan project, so it's not like he has any copyright or trademark rights to using Fallout in the first place. But I don't know, maybe Bethesda could have thrown him a bone or something. Now, of course, all of this happened, like, right after the release of Fallout 4, so there's a lot of discussions and talk, and it is possible that, uh, just Bethesda never got around to it, but I don't know. It's a weird one for sure. In 2007, Majestic released a game called Limbo of the Lost. This was a point-and-click adventure game released exclusively on the PC. Now, the year after after this game released, a ton of accusations came to light of this game just copying and using assets from other games like The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, and eventually there was multiple lawsuits filed against the studio by multiple different copyright holders. Now the studio actually pulled the sales of the game after all this stuff came to light and said that they had not knowingly infringed any copyright. Now actually it was kind of hard to even find information on the studio and what happened with these lawsuits that were filed, because I think after this came to light, the studio studio fell apart and people just started leaving. So I think eventually the studio shut down and this was the only game they have ever made so it was pretty easy to just shut everything down and move on I guess. And actually this is one of the few cases where there's actually straight up you know assets ripped from these other games and the evidence is pretty damning. I mean if you see Oblivion and this game side by side you'll see right away that it's just Oblivion locations straight up in this game. So it is like an open and shut case actually even in the public's eye because this whole game was just straight up riddled with plagiarism. There's also a really interesting legal battle called Stardock Systems versus Raishi, which is one of those copyright stories where things actually went to court. And it is really interesting. Essentially, Paul Raishi III, and I hope I'm saying his name right, and Fred Ford developed in the 90s a game called Star Control. And they made another game, a sequel to it, called Star Control 2. These games were somewhat successes for the 90s but when it came time for a third game to be made they decided they didn't want to develop it so they licensed the game out to Accolade. So Accolade went on they developed the third version of the game and they released that and they essentially had like publishing rights to the game into the 2000s until the game was unlisted and no longer for sale. In 1999 though 
Accolade ended up getting purchased by another company named Infograms Entertainment, which was a company that ended up merging with Atari and then all of it rebranded under Atari by 2003. Long story short, Atari relisted the first two control games on GOG.com, selling a re-released version of the game. Wait, and they didn't own the rights to that? Uh, well, they kinda did. This is where it gets confusing. They had like the trademark rights, but then it gets even more confusing because Atari declared bankruptcy in 2013, its assets were put up for auction, and a company named Stardock came in and they purchased the rights to all of that, including the trademark with Star Control. The new company, Stardock, started working on a new Star Control game at the same time as the two original developers were working on like a successor type game. This caused to a ton of confusion and an ensuing legal battle that was kind of interesting because the way the rights and and trademark got divided it was kind of an unprecedented thing, but now something that is looked to as like a precedent in intellectual copyright laws. Long story short, an agreement was made that Stardock would get to keep the name trademark for Star Control and the developers would be able to make their game as long as it isn't called Star Control, but they would retain the rights to the contents within Star Control 1 and 2. So. Everyone was happy, I guess, kind of. It's really interesting if you ever want to do like a full deep dive on some legal thing that's now like toted as one of the big legal battles in gaming, but it is a little bit confusing. And it's interesting that this is all just over like a 90s game. So when you say they own the contents to the first two games, does that mean like the mechanics and like the assets? So essentially Stardock agreed that they won't use any like plots or characters from the first two games that released and the developers are allowed to use those characters but then they can't call the game Stardock. Oh okay so that's the content they own. They, they own the lore basically. Right but it is interesting to see something that's like a established universe or story getting split up by different owners because it's just not something you usually see, but I guess when they made the original deal, they must have agreed to sell off like the trademark itself for Stardock, which means that it kind of exists in its own way, and then there's this other thing going on. It's kind of like what happened with Harvest Moon, but less of like a localization result and more of like some crazy legal deals that just kind of were like written into trademark law. Real question, Luke, did you ever play the Gianna sisters back in the day? I did actually not play them though. Okay, the Gianna sisters is kind of a wild concept. It's literally a game that looks exactly like Mario. Like, I mean, there's no way of putting it on. It's the Super Mario Bros for the NES. It just is a clone of it. It's not exact one for one, but it's very heavily inspired and it intentionally took on the art style of, you know, Super Mario Bros. What's interesting though is there was like the gossip on the playground or the streets back in the days was that the game was mysteriously delisted from like physical stores. Like they, they stopped selling the game, they like put them in boxes in the back or something. Like they pulled all the copies. Yeah. And there was like all the, like obviously the, the rumor was Nintendo was suing them for copying Super Mario Bros, which technically apparently wasn't the case. There's no like lawsuits that were ever actually filed, but it's now rumored that Nintendo did send like a threatening letter and maybe a cease and desist to stop selling the game that infringed on their copyright or that they believed infringed on their copyright. And uh, Gianna Sisters was kind of removed, but the game was still successful enough where it spawned into this big series where they continued to release games like that weren't related to that first one as just like a platforming game now. Then like in 2012, there was like, a Kickstarter to bring back Gianna Sisters. It raised an okay enough amount of money to have the project greenlit and then boom the Gianna Sisters came out and it was you know, just like an okay game. It was like a mediocre platformer but the big thing here the takeaway is the story comes full circle because they started off copying Mario but then they landed in a deal with whoever owns the modern day rights to Accolade games and were able to make Bubsy. The revival of Bubsy. The most loved mascot character from back in the day. The greatest games. The most polished games. They were never bad originally. And this studio was now put in charge of making a Bubsy game. They literally just reused all of their assets from the Gianna sisters and threw Bubsy in there. And uh, if you have the games up side by side, you can tell they look very 
very similar. So it is funny that now all of a sudden Bubsy is essentially stealing from the Gianna sisters, even though it's the same studio that made it. But then they made a sequel to Bubsy that wasn't even the studio that did Gianna Sisters, but then that used the same assets from the first Bubsy. So it's like this whole rabbit hole of, I don't know. It sounds like a legal mess. Yeah, something like that. Have you ever heard of the movie Frankenstein's Army from 2013? What? <laughs> what? What are you talking about? That's the intro to the section. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I haven't, Luke. Okay, you haven't. Yeah, it's, it's like a horror film. I don't know. It's like a Dutch film or something. When Resident Evil Village came out, the director spoke out and said that Resident Evil Village stole his monster designs from his movie that he released in 2013. Oh, wait, that's spicy. And I'm going to send you a picture, right? And you tell me um, if you think, I mean, I do think they look similar, but you know, I I'll tell you, you know. <laughs> I didn't scroll down on my discord and all I have are three pictures of Paul Reishi <laughs> from the section we talked on star control <laughs> from his Wikipedia page that I sent you earlier. And I just have his picture just three times across <laughs> my screen. Okay, let's look at this Resident Evil thing. What? Wait, actually? On the left is Resident Evil, on the right is the movie. Okay, I can kind of see the similarities though. Right, and like the way this monster dies is in a similar fashion in both the movie and Resident Evil, right? Right. I think he jams something in it and then like the propeller blows up and it, start, it, it starts fire. Now, technically, is one of them a chainsaw though? The other one's like a propeller? One of them has like chainsaws as their propeller things. Yeah, that, right. that's fair. Okay. But then there's like more, right? But I'm going to send you a thread. There's like more allegations of monster designs but the further i go through this the less like i see it i feel like the last one especially yeah like, the last it looks one like is the weird, pose like, me is just they're like look the pose is almost the same is it because they're bald also is that the bathroom from border in rainbow six siege yes yes this was filmed <laughs> on border rainbow six siege. sorry I, I have that game on my mind i guess anyway so like the director spoke out and you know it, it did nothing really came of it because I don't think he owns the rights to the character designs, right? It is questionable if he even can, because like he put a propeller on some dude. I said like, really? Like that innovative of a concept, like or avant-garde of a concept, you know? And then the second picture, it's like a hammerhead shark inspired design. And then the third picture is like a, like an, like an old school diver suit. You know what I mean? So like, you know, I, I, there might be an inspiration there, but like, I, I don't know if you can call inspiration like a, rip off necessarily it'd be like if i was like trying to plan out a movie and you were helping me with the costumes and we decided to do like a big clock shaped monster right like okay that's an original idea but then we'll like you know nintendo come after us because of like tt from diddy kong racing that's like a giant clock you know what i mean like if you just take an idea and you're like okay let's like take a propeller that's spinning which is kind of terrifying and just like throw it on a person right i mean because like the propeller thing like i don't know if you ever seen indiana jones right you're like scared of the propellers you know what i mean like right uh, it's just like a, it's just like this this fear i mean that's what horror games are or horror right. games and horror movies are about like this like weird fear that you have also like i don't know if someone had a machete is that you know what i mean is that also like copyright infringement because jason has a machete it's it's like the argument like you know, all the masked murder movies, even like Halloween and... Uh, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Scream. Yeah, those movies. They're, I mean, like, they all, like, borrow inspiration from each other, right? Yeah, and I mean, like, they... Th the thing is, they pioneer the genre, so, like... You know what I mean? Like, th there will be a lot of inspiration taken from these movies, you know what I mean? Like, the bigger a medium is, the bigger the inspiration will be, because... And, like, not even, like, on purpose. And the same goes for Pal World again, I guess. Because, like, Pokemon is the biggest media franchise, right? So, like, when you're designing monsters, you might just subconsciously think of Pokemon anyways. I was just thinking, dude, you know, we should side quest and do, like, make some, like, slasher films. I feel like they'd be really easy to make. And, like, the premise and story would be pretty easy. But, like, we'll have our bad guy. We'll call him, like, Murder Mike or something like that. And everyone's just running from Murder Mike. And he's like a knife or something. A murder mic? Yeah, I don't know. Just... I think that'd be a good idea for a, a, a movie. A movie series. Not just one. Movie series? Like a trilogy. Yeah, just... And it takes place on a plane. Okay, who's murder? Who's playing murder mic, though? Boogie? You know... Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to speak my mind. I can't say what I've... I'll all be in trouble if I speak what I want to say. But uh, I don't know if we should pick up Boogie for... Uh... 
someone that's chasing people. Wow. I can't believe you said that, Luke. <laughs> Just cut to the next one. Okay. Now, I want to circle everything back because this all started with, like, Pal World and Pokemon. But do you remember the true optimal Pokemon experience that nobody talks about nowadays from Roblox? Yeah. Brick Bronze you're talking about? Brick Bronze. Pokemon Brick Bronze. Definitely something overlooked. Definitely something forgotten about often. But it is a project that Nintendo straight up DMCA'd Roblox and had them wipe off the face of the platform. But for a while, it was one of the most popular Roblox games. It was a fan-made Pokemon project where they recreated like the whole battling engine within Roblox. So you could do like Pokemon battles. And then from there, built an entire Pokemon game. And I think they were like almost completely done with the game or they were getting very close to the end but it was like a full-fledged story like a pokemon game would be but you could play it with your friends you could collect all types of pokemon you could shiny hunt you could battle other players there was trainers along the way and like pretty much every single pokemon from like up until that point was featured in the game like the starters you could pick from at the beginning were just all of the starters it was really cool uh People were trading and, and trying to like catch rare shiny Pokemon. We had this whole community around it and then it just got shut down. And it was a shame because like that was a really ambitious project. I mean, legally speaking, they didn't really have anything to stand on. Right. I mean, yeah. But I mean, that was a straight up like copy and paste of Pokemon, but it was kind of like a better Pokemon experience, at least than kind of what we had back then. Like, it was during, like, the Let's Go Pokemon times, you know. Those the were dark like, times. The dark times. I think it was even a little before that. So, uh, it, it was just an interesting game. And it's a shame that it did get shut down so hard that, like, I don't think there's any way that, a, like, someone could find it and play it now. Maybe if you had, like, the developer pack that the developers used to work on, you could play it in, like, an offline mode of Roblox through its, like, development side, but I don't know if that's actually possible. But I, I always thought that it was interesting how, like, that existed. Like, there's some people out there who were quick enough to get to play through and enjoy that while they could, because it was ambitious. Sure, it looked silly with the big Roblox characters that looked like a Kanye West music video, but the game was cool. Had some heart. Yeah, and I mean, like, I don't know. I looked it up, like, a full playthrough is, like, 10 or 11 hours, so, like, they had a they had a big campaign in there. Yeah, it was, it was cool. I, I think... If I, I wish I would have spent more time when I did play it, uh, just because I tried it out to see what it was like. And if I would have given it more time, I think I could have really gotten into it. Uh, now it's gone. Now we never will have that chance. I mean, at the end of the day, if they decide their own Pokemon, they might have uh, been able to stay, uh, you know, up. Who knows? They should have just taken all of the Pokemon models that they put in the game and slightly changed them. And then <laughs> they wouldn't be able to copyright claim it. But imagine the outrage on Twitter, dude, if they did that. This is before Twitter was, like, crazy. Well, I don't know if Twitter's ever been not crazy. I don't know. I'm really curious to see what Nintendo ends up doing with the whole Power World situation. I feel like it's... I mean, I wonder if this statement is just, like, them doing, like, a little threatening letter like they did with the Gianna sisters. Or if this is actually something. I think it's, like, please stop talking to us about this. Yeah, we see your emails. You know what I mean? Like, because every Nintendo post for days, like they post about some random indie game releasing, it'll be like 5,000 comments like, what do you guys think about Pal World? Pal World better. You know, it's just f***ing annoying. I have to make a statement too. You can't say that word. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll have to censor. I really want to find, I, I probably wouldn't be hard, but I'd love to go on Twitter and find someone and be like, hey, Nintendo, like at Nintendo. I don't know if you know this, but there's this game called Pal World that is, uh, stealing your character models or something like that just like someone just <laughs> tweeting right to like, it's like today even like days Dude, after to be, this like, is all like there has to be like one person like oh, i gotta let nintendo know about this Dude, like someone just feels that obligation yeah <laughs> i love that uh, this was a fun video. Big thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Go play War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox, and register using our link in the pinned comment or video description. New players and those who haven't played in six months will score an awesome bonus pack with premium vehicles, in-game currency, and more on all platforms. If you made it this far, uh, leave a comment saying, um, what did I say? Blue. What? Blue. Blue? Okay, that's not what I heard. But, uh, oh. yeah. Blue's fine. <laughs> Let's say blue, yeah. And, cool. uh, you know, you know, thanks to all the Patreons, you know, that you see on screen right now. And uh, If you want to have your name next to Luke's face with the Patreons scrolling down, uh, check out our Patreon. Link down below. Yeah, go check it out. And uh, otherwise, we'll see you guys next time with a 
brand new video. Bye. Bye.